Thank you. Um, that's always hard to back up a keynote speaker and one that's talking about cutting edge and the future. Uh, it's also nice to have those uh, discussions straight after lunch on the final day and it's credit to everyone for sticking around uh, for that. Um, thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about this. Uh, for those not familiar with the Internet Society, uh, we're a global non-for-profit organisation that uh, seeks to empower people to keep the internet open, uh, trustworthy, secure, and many other things. Uh, how the internet was first established, I guess. Um, our work includes uh, training communities on how to build and manage their own networks, defending against decisions uh, that may fragment the internet, advocating for greater encryption, uh, securing the global routing system through the Manners program, which uh, I hope many of you are here are participants of, and if not, please go back and sign up, and helping everyone to understand the health, availability, and evolution of the global internet. And that's the topic that I'll be discussing here today. Um, while I know most of you have your fingers on the pulse of your own networks, you might not have that overall holistic view of the internet as, say, Jeff does. And that's why you come to these conferences, why you subscribe to mailing lists, to get an understanding of it. Um, at the same time, it may not be as part of your business, uh, overall business strategy to understand and keep aware of, of the global trends in terms of resilience. Um, what I hope you leave with today is that it's worth keeping abreast of what's happening overseas as well as in country uh, and that there's a lot to learn from the misfortunes of uh, other networks and countries out there uh, as well as the successes too. Uh, with assessing your own network's uh, capa capabilities and resilience as well as uh, Australia's or whoever, whichever country you come from. So. What we'll be covering today is I'll be discussing three case studies of how internet resilience in uh, Europe and North America has been compromised in the past 12 months, or 12 and, 12 and a bit months. Uh, I'll then share a snapshot of Australia's internet resilience and see how it compares with these countries and other countries in the region in terms of its strengths and weaknesses. And finally, I'll discuss uh, the need to improve the resolution of national internet ecosystem data to allow decision makers to make more informed decisions on improving the internet's health in their country. So ISOC has been running its Measuring the Internet project for around three years. Uh, the outfacing pro uh, product is the Pulse platform. Uh, which curates open source data to examine internet trends and tell data-driven stories so that policymakers, researchers, journalists, network engineers, civil society groups uh, can better understand the health of the internet. Uh, our current focus areas are tracking internet shutdowns uh, and the economic loss associated with them. We recently uh, launched a net loss tool which calculates uh, the economic impact of a internet shutdown, whether it be content or uh, actual uh, full internet shutdown in the country. Uh, the state of deployment of critical technologies such as IPv6, DNSSEC, QUIC, uh, TLS 1.3 and HTTPS. Uh, the concentration of infrastructure at services and markets, uh, as Jeff alluded to, it is very concentrated. And finally, the resilience of the internet in more than 170 countries. In terms of the last of these focus areas, we developed an internet resilience index, which I'll be referring to during this presentation. The IRI collates and tracks open source internet resilience metrics to support decision makers in their projects related to improving the internet's resilience at a local, regional and international level. The IRI draws upon more than 20 open data sources and uses best practices, uh, best practices methodologies to calculate a snapshot of a country's internet resilience in terms of its infrastructure, its market readiness, its security, and performance. And I'll speak to each of these pillars and the metrics that are associated underneath them as we go along. So 
the first internet resilience case study that I'll be talking to is that of the Ukraine, uh, which I've composed from my colleagues Amrish and Aftab's uh, blog posts on the Pulse blog that delved into the changes of Ukraine's internet since the start of the war. Ukraine has been a role model of internet resilience in the Eastern European bloc uh, for many years and has always scored relatively high on the four pillars of the IRI. Having this solid base, particularly for its infrastructure, security and market readiness, has helped the Ukraine uh, maintain its internet con connectivity during the war. Four metrics that I wanted to specifically draw your attention to are the number of IXPs, uh, the manners score, uh, upstream redundancy and market diversity. All these have helped uh, in insulate local connectivity in many ways, from the targeted cyber and physical attacks that Russia has uh, made on Ukraine's infrastructure. As can be seen here, Ukraine has a fairly diverse interconnectivity, uh, a strong peering fabric, uh, as yours, and uh, that's supported by 27 IXPs in the country as well. Importantly, this hasn't changed, even though around 100 ASNs have moved out of the country during uh, the war. Uh, while Kyivstar is the dominant ISP in the country, more than three quarters of the remaining uh, traffic is provisioned by multiple other providers. This has especially been important given that Kyivstar has experienced increased latency and decreased throughput since the beginning of the war. Importantly, 71% of networks are implementing best current routing security practices, 99% of which are documented their routing announcements in the IRR and 40% in RPKI. While we don't yet show exit points in the IRI, we recognise it as an important indicator of the country's internet resilience. Ukraine doesn't have any submarine cables, so it relies on its terrestrial uh, cable links. Uh, and it's lucky that it shares borders with countries that it doesn't want to go to, well, that don't go on to go to war with it, uh, many of them. Um, earlier this year, Jim Cowie pointed out in a post on the Pulse blog, how operators and regulators in countries surrounding Russia have and will continue to assess the long-term future of international transit links it has with Russia, and will most likely look to develop more redundancy through other terrestrial uh, links and where opportunities exist, submarine links. Um, that segues nice to uh, my next uh, case study, which is that of the Rogers Cable uh, mobile fixed line outage uh, back in July last year. Uh, again, Jim uh, wrote on this at the time. Uh, the outage spread across the Rogers Cable mobile and fixed lines uh, and affected around 12 million subscribers and indirectly prevented all businesses nationwide from being able to accept debit card transactions, affected several government services, including the Canadian border security, impacted the, on the timing of one quarter of all traffic signals in Toronto, and denied access for the whole nation to 911 services. That outage was 19 hours long. Over a, overall, it was estimated to have cost the Canadian economy nearly 142 million USD and Rogers 150 million USD in customer credits. Rogers has never provided a post-mortem on the outage, except for this comment from the CEO a day after the outage. A month later, on 12th of August, Rogers responded to a request from the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission confirming in broad strokes that the outage was the result of configuration change that deleted a route filter flooding certain network routing equipment and resulting in a core network failure with broad impact. Cloudflare reported on a spike in BGP updates and the hour leading up to the outage, as well as withdrawals of IP prefixes, noting that Rogers was not advertising its pre presence, causing other networks to not find the Rogers network. Rogers normally advertises around 1,000 IPv4 and IPv6 network 
blocks in the global BGP table. But as those advertisements were withdrawn in great gulps over the course of the next hour, leaving most Rogers IP addresses unreachable from the global internet, the traffic dropped to zero. Whatever the cause, the impact was much more far-reaching than an internet outage for a single AS on the internet, as even Rogers mobile customers overseas found themselves cut off, suggesting the signaling uh, protocols that enable roaming negotiation with visited networks were impacted. In relation to the second point, the recently approved merger between Rogers and Shaw Communication only strengthens the oligopoly of the country and makes the size of, of the impact of these events even greater. Depending on how, the merge of the, how they merge the two networks, we may expect changes in the country's market diversity. Outside of this, Canada's overall resilience isn't that bad given its size and population. Although I will point out that I don't think its uh, internet is particularly affordable, having just returned uh, and spending 100 Canadian dollars on 40 gigs of data. That's the resilience for that. So we jump across the Atlantic again, back to Italy. Uh, final case study is based on uh, my colleague Max Stucci's um, write-up on the Italian outage, which happened on the 5th of February this year. Um, so Italy's largest uh, ISP, TIM, uh, which is tel Telecom Italia, suffered a major network outage that affected more than one in three of Italy's internet users for five hours. As shown by IJ's network dependency, three of Italy's top eight net largest networks based on user base are managed by Telecom Italia Group. AS6762 uh, uh, is an international carrier that serves as a transit provider for many networks in Italy, but does not directly serve any end users. It operates as a separate entity, but is fully owned by Telecom Italia. AS3269 is Tim's landline network, which directly serves 20.8% of the population. And because it's used as a transit network, it indirectly serves around 8% of the country's population. And if we include the other 8 or so percent of the population its mobile network serves, we reach 38% of Italy's inhabitants. So the Italian NOG group runs a telegram uh, group that was active during the outage, as you would imagine, uh, with many participants trying to figure out what's going on. And with uh, both Telecom Italia and their upstream provider, Sparkle, uh, trying to provide updates to them as well. Uh, like Rogers, Tim and Sparkle have never come out with a post-mortem on what happened. Uh, so we can really only speculate on the, is on the issue and how Tim could have avoided it. Um, through greater redundancy and more interconnection. Given that the issue was located around international connectivity, which Tim buys from Sparkle, also affected DNS resolvers on Tim's network and apparently some of its triple PoE's servers and disrupted connectivity between some locations in the country around the same time. So as a network operator, fault handling should be a priority, right? as well as designing your network so there's no single point of failure, something that Craig mentioned before. However, as can be seen here in the Hurricane Electric BGP toolkit, uh, Tim doesn't provide a very good example of this uh, since it only relies on Sparkle for international connectivity. And if we compare that to Vodafone Italia, uh, it has five upstream providers, which provides plenty of redundancy when one of the upstreams does go down. If we look at Italy's IRI profile, we can see how this affects the whole country's internet resilience with both upstream redundancy and diversity around 60%. In comparison to Australia, this is actually very good, at, uh, as I'll be showing you soon. To give you some further context on how this perfect storm eventuated, before 2013, Tim was forced, to, uh, forced by law to peer with every Italian operator. This meant that its peering matrix was really complex, but very diversified. 
However, since 2013, the laws have changed and almost all of Tim's peering relationships were discontinued. This is probably shared by a lot of countries with um, incumbents. Uh, what this means is that in many cases, in local internet users wanted to reach users on one of Tim's networks, traffic needs to transit via Frankfurt, Germany, where it enters the Sparkle network, and then it gets delivered back to Tim in Milan. This increases latency, which is 53% for fixed lines and 14% for mobile, and costs to connect with the TIM networks, and could be avoided if TIM peered with local ISPs. So in 2020, 2021, TIM temporarily set up uh, peering sessions with uh, any network that requested it to absorb the traffic for those working from home during lockdowns. Uh, Tim had also set up a peering arrangement with uh, one of the IXs as well, but that dis discontinued in 2021, late 21. Uh, this is a situation that Tim has chosen. It does not have any technical basis, rather it's political stance. And this outage could not have been a better way to show how important connecting to IXPs is. That's a plug for IAA. So, to Australia, and according to the IRI, Australia has a resiliency score of 57%. And how that rates to others in the region, not too bad. Um, how it rates with the largest countries in the world, again, not too bad. And that's an important part to consider as well with this uh, index score, population size, uh, number of internet users and land mass, as we'll get to soon. Uh, you'll note in neither of those slides I added China. Uh, this has been mentioned before that the validity of data that comes out of China is um, questionable to say the least. So while if you do want to know the score, it's 45%. We do calculate the score. It's you can make your own comparisons whether or not to it is that or not. So when we look at the four pillars for Australia, we can see that the scores are fairly similar, around that 50 to 60% range. Uh, highlighting the successes first, 96% mobile coverage, it's the same as Canada, uh, shows all the great work that you've all been doing over these past 30 years to expand that. Again, for the size of the country, it's a credit. Uh, fixed jitter and mobile download speeds are both strong. HTTPS adoption has been widespread in Australia for a long time and IPv6 capabilities has been growing around that global average of 5% per annum. Um, Australia is traditionally ranked high uh, with Global Cyber Security Index and the number of secure internet servers has increased by a factor of 10 since 2015 four times greater than the world average and is ranked 24th in the world as of 2020. And credit to the government for its work and what they've done with their partners to increase the Australia's e-government development index score from 12th to 7th as well. You note I've put a dashed line around IXPs and peering efficiency. Um, thanks to the presence of major IXPs in metropolitan cities, the landscape of local interconnection in Australia appears to be thriving. As we know, these IXPs play pivotal, pivotal roles in uh, enhancing the overall internet infrastructure and connectivity within the country and keeping traffic local as much as possible. However, it's important to know with this metric who is connected to the IXPs in the country. So if we look at the total interconnections in Australia, using peering DVD data from major IXPs, then we see 1,800 connections. In many IXPs, there are redundant connections from a single network. Uh, for example, Mega IX Sydney, Netflix has two connections. So if we combine all the IXP peers and only take the unique ASNs, then we end up with 517 networks out of 1,800 connections across all the major IXPs in the major cities. And out of that 517 networks, only 333 networks actually belong to the Australian networks. So we're taking away all Amazons and Netflixes. So from 1,200 networks which rely, 
That leaves more than 1,200 networks that rely on other big networks, such as Telstra, Vocus, Optus, Superloop, to provide them with international transit as well as local traffic. Keep Tim in the back of your mind. So this is only one of the many areas uh, where there's some challenges ahead for Australia that we can work upon. And that's the thing, we can work on them. Enabling infrastructure is lower than all three of the case study countries that I've discussed today. Fixed download and upload speeds, um, we're ranked 82nd in the world in this metric per UCLA. While it's great that AUDA has uh, deployed DNSSEC, uh, DNSSEC validation across the board, we're ranked 145th in the world. Um, kudos to our friends from Bangladesh here, uh, 86%, oh, sorry, 93% uh, to our friends across the ditch, 86%. Routing hygiene is at a teenage phase, it seems, though it's great that more of you are becoming managed participants. And finally, many people will rationalise our lower upstream provider diversity and market diversity scores are largely factors of the size of our market in Australia. However, this should be a cause of concern, especially when we compare it to Italy, which even though it had a considerably higher score for both of these metrics, one third of its users went offline because of their reliance on that one ISP. Again, you'll note that I've put a dashed line around five to 10 K reach. Uh, increasing this metric is a challenge. We know this. Uh, know this for all the countries with large land masses, uh, which especially sparsely populators. Uh, out of the 10 countries that I showed you before of the largest, uh, we're at the lower end. Canada's 49%, Russia's 29%. On the topic, uh, Australia's terrestrial fibre cable system has made significant strides in connection, uh, connecting urban centres and improving digital connectivity. However, it's essential to acknowledge that a substantial portion of the country's population still resides outside the current fibre coverage area, highlighting the need for continued expansion. Multiple decisions by MBN have definitely made it difficult, but we believe their long-term technological journey may end up being the right decision. We believe. Finally, we recognise that the score of this data, which is the ITU, is contentious, but it is the most wide-reaching project that is measuring this metric. Again, we come back to, we measure it for 170 countries. This is a bit of a limitation of measurement projects, having data for as many countries as you can. This brings me on to the limitations as well. So what I've shown you here is merely a guide. And some of you may scoff at some of those figures that you saw. You may have better data sources and say, you should look at this. Again, we're only taking open source data that's out there. We're trying to bring it together and try and paint a picture of the overall holistic uh, resilience of the internet for countries. Uh, this is, this is uh, directed for non-technical audiences. Uh, we have a very technical audience here, but also you report to very non-technical people as well and trying to convince those people is how you get change. You've all experienced this in your own lives. So it can be a tool in that way to present a picture or paint a picture of why you need to do deploy DNSSEC for, certain, for, that, for an example. To no, by no means are we saying this is a source of truth. Uh, it just provides that digestible view uh, and help you uh, with decision makers. Uh, we advocate for greater localised data sourcing and sharing uh, and providing, this will provide greater resolution uh, to what really is happening at the edge. Uh, this is something that Dr Vijay Sivaraman has uh, discussed here at Osnog before. And this is only the first version as well of the index. Uh, and we plan to on expanding it in the future to include uh, things like the exit points, uh, terrestrial cabling and that. Um, as well as to also incorporate a new pillar in which we'll be looking at uh, climate and natural disaster risk as well. So that's, we've already learned from a couple of talks uh, 
over the last two days, that's a growing trend as well that we need to increase the resilience of our networks for. So to conclude, understanding what's happening upstream and beyond our shores is equally as important as knowing the health of our own network. You might want to know your networks, you might want to know the networks that you're peering with and the routes that you're taking are resilient and so you won't be up for any sudden costs to purchase capacity on the chance of any mishap. Some of you may also be servicing customers in other countries or considering doing so. Again, knowing internet resilience of those countries and links between can help you understand the risk and where you might need to invest. And while it's unfortunate that others have mishaps, you can learn from them and should share your own mishaps and successes so that others can learn from them too. And I think you do a really good job of that as well with the Osnog mailing list. Further to this, having an insightful national measurement system in place helps validate this sort of data that we and decision makers are becoming more reliant on to help us address the weaknesses in the ecosystem. Finally, your network's health and the network of the whole of Australia's internet is in connected with the 70,000 plus uh, networks that make up the internet. We all have a role to play to make sure it's all robust and secure. If you want to keep in touch, check out the Pulse website, subscribe to our monthly mailing list, and we're also lo always looking for partners and ideas for how to improve this tool and other tools as well. Thank you.